Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the TechSRX Medications for Substance Use Disorders ECHO. Please note that we are recording these sessions for later distribution. Please note that anything listed in the chat will not appear in the recording. My name is Shreya Prasanna, and I will be facilitating today's session. A few quick announcements before we begin to help us with attendance, please enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat, which can be accessed by clicking on the speech bubble icon at the navigation bar at the bottom of your window. If you are one of our BeWell Texas providers, please make sure that you identify yourselves during this session. If you're joining via phone, please email your phone number and email to bewelltx at yudhiska.edu. Some housekeeping, please stay muted unless you're speaking. If you've joined by computer, your mute button at the bottom left of your Zoom. If you're on the phone, just press star six. We encourage everyone to speak at these sessions, especially during the discussion portion. We want to hear from as many of you as possible. So please keep your comments brief to allow time for others to speak up. Or if you'd so prefer, you can use the chat feature to share comments and questions. Please note that no protected health information is allowed in either the chat or the discussions, and that means names, emails, dates, or any information that can easily identify an individual. If you'd like to view closed captioning for this session, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the Show Captions option. Towards the end of the session, the Bewell Texas team will send out a link to an evaluation survey. All participants filling out the survey will be automatically entered into a raffle for a $30 Walmart gift card. Besides that, you can give us valuable feedback to help shape these sessions. Our didactic today is on the use of psychedelics in alcohol use disorder and will be presented by Dr. Van King. Following that, we will discuss a case presented by Dr. Abby Evel. We will start with introductions, didactics, Bewell program announcements, case presentation, and open discussion. Thank you all again for joining today's ECHO. We look forward to learning alongside you and encourage you all to share your experiences, questions, and insights in today's conversation. And with that, we will move on to some introductions. Dr. King. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Van King. I'm a professor in the Psychiatry Behavioral Sciences Department at uh, UT Health San Antonio, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself uh, when I start the talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Waklu. Hi, uh, Siddharth Waklu. I'm an addiction psychiatrist at UT Southwestern. I am the uh, director for addiction services here at UT Southwestern and the director for the addiction psychiatry fellowship here. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Walker. Good afternoon, everybody. Crystal Walker, doctorally trained PA, and I am the Director of Substance Use Disorder Clinical Services for My Health, My Resources of Tarrant County in Fort Worth, Texas. I think Shreya froze probably, so maybe it's Dr. Kowalczyk's chance to introduce herself. Thank you. Sure, Alicia, Dr. Kowalczyk, Associate Professor of Family and Community Medicine here at Baylor College of Medicine, Medical Director for Santa Maria Hostel and the Insight Expert Program for Harris Health. Thank you, Dr. Kowalczyk and Jasmine. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Vidal. I'm a CSTAP program coordinator. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Andrea, for taking over. <laughs> and I apologize, my Zoom acted up. And uh, I will move on to Dr. Evel for introduction. Hi, my name is Dr. Abby Yule. Um, I work at UT Southwestern. I'm a part of the addiction psychiatry team at Parkland Hospital. I'm addiction medicine certified. Thank you so much. And with that, we will move on to our didactics for today. Um, Dr. King, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, let's see here. Share screen, right? 
Does that look pretty good? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, I'm just going to minimize this. There we go. Okay. So, uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, I, I've been following uh, this uh, interest in psychedelics for for a number of years. Um, actually, I, I, I happened to work at Hopkins uh, when uh, uh, Dr. Roland Griffiths just sort of started his progr program. And uh, he, he, along with, with a couple other pioneers, uh, uh, started this, um, it, it, you know, sort of re-interest in psychedelics. Boy, it must be 15, 20 years ago now or something. And it's really blossomed. Uh, uh, as I'm sure anybody that's uh, reading uh, newspapers and, uh, and, uh, um, and medical journals. So today we're, we're going to talk about a particular study looking at um, uh, using psilocybin to, to help with uh, um, alcohol use disorder treatment. And uh, yeah, talk, talk a, a little bit about, you, you know, how that could possibly help, but also all of the various complications in trying to interpret um, j just how uh, psychedelics might be helpful in, uh, in any kind of mental health treatment. So the usual uh, disclosures. Uh, so to, today we're going to talk about the different types of psychedelic compounds. Uh, uh, actually, uh, work in, in uh, very different kinds of mechanisms of action, uh, depending on the categories that we're talking about. Um, and we're going to go over uh, one study uh, today. Uh, a, a, a nice. Uh, um, a nice recently published study um, and uh, uh, take a look at the uh, positives and, and, and negatives uh, of, of what it could tell us. And then uh, talk a little bit about uh, limitations in our current knowledge of this area and, and uh, uh, some of the, I think, less described uh, uh, potential adverse uh, uh, effects that uh, come along with these uh, kinds of treatments. So psychedelics is, is sort of a broad category. It's uh, defined as compounds that alter perception and cognitions. Uh, I put here extensive off-label use, but really the only one of these that really has a labeling from the FDA is esketamine. Uh, uh, ketamine also um, has... Uh, um, De defined effects, but it isn't uh, really labeled for mental health use, even though it's used quite a bit uh, for that. Um, there's, uh, you know, clearly increasing interest in in uh, in uh, medical use in psychiatric, um, um, you know, situations. Um, I, I group these into you know, four sort of loose categories. One, hallucinogens, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, then there's MDMA, which is currently being investigated, uh, um, seen most recently for uh, PTSD to help uh, uh, people with uh, um, you know their PTSD therapy. Uh, people call it an intactogen because of its pro-social effects. Uh, this is, um, more sort of you know positive kinds of feelings and uh, connectedness to other people is is a uh, very prominent effect of MDMA. Um, uh, with uh, ketamine and esketamine is actually a dissociative anesthetic and can be used in surgical procedures. Uh, it acts in the glutamate system and is an NMDA antagonist. Um, you know, people may or may not be uh, in psychotherapy at the same time they take ketamine or esketamine treatment, uh, but it isn't uh, uh, it doesn't isn't typically used in conjunction with um, 
with uh, psychotherapies or, or psychotherapeutic uh, sessions as hallucinogens often are. And then there's a, a couple of other uh, psychedelic compounds, uh, salvinorin A and ibogaine, uh, that um, also interact with the serotonin and other kinds of uh, neurotransmitter systems, but they're also kappa opioid agonists, which is a specific um, uh, neuroreceptor in the brain uh, that's um, associated with opioid, uh, with the opioid molecule. And um, uh, they also have this uh, um, additional uh, um, action that uh, uh, so, some uh, some researchers feel may have a significant uh, other effect. So the classical hallucinogens are uh, uh, psilocybin, which comes originally from uh, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, LSD, which is synthetic. Um, uh, mescaline, I think, sometimes can be uh, um, uh, grouped in here, but it, it does have a somewhat uh, different uh, chemical structure. Um, uh, uh, DMT, or dimethyltryptamine, is an active compound in ayahuasca, which is, uh, um, uh, is uh, from these herbs in, uh, uh, that are uh, grown in Central America. And I, Ibogaine is uh, from uh, plants in Africa. And you can see that uh, uh, many of these have been used uh, in history for sort of sacramental spiritual practices and uh, you know, basically for their you know, mind-bending, mind-expanding kinds of, uh, of uh, effects uh, that are used in ritual practice. Uh, Salvinorin A is another uh, um, uh, of these uh, compounds that's uh, that's can be purified from um, uh, from plants. Um, the thing these uh, um, compounds have in common is that they have a similar structure to uh, serotonin and act on the serotonin receptors. And uh, the specific one that seems to be most of interest for the uh, sort of hallucinogenic kinds of, um, uh, of activity is the uh, 5-HT is, is, uh, is a short uh, way of saying serotonin. Uh, and it's specifically the 2A receptors uh, that seem to uh, be um, uh, primarily responsible for these uh, hallucinogenic uh, kinds of actions. Uh, psychedelics enter uh, the cell and stimulate these receptors um, and interestingly, you know, some NIH studies have shown that uh, they, uh, uh, they can stimulate neuroplasticity and uh, dendritic, uh, dendritic growth. So these are you know, qualities of, of cells in the brain that um, uh, uh, can uh, promote these uh, new connections between, uh, um, you know, between brain cells and in, in uh, uh, different areas of the brain. And that these can go for up to, uh, these can have sort of increased um, um, uh, growth and activity uh, for up to three weeks after even one or two treatments. Um, so, you know, this makes it very interesting to speculate about how this might be, uh, you know, having some kind of effect on how um, folks might uh, so have some improvement in various kinds of symptoms. Uh, like depression or, or, you know, in this case, alcohol use or other kinds of uh, drug use problems. Uh, one, one thing that had occurred to me, and, and I, I don't know whether it's, uh, um, you know, other people would think about this, is that we often talk about serotonin more in the context of antidepressants. And, uh, and, and so just to point out that these are very different mechanisms of action, the hallucinogens and, and, and these other compounds that we're talking about uh, have a direct effect on the serotonin receptors, um, whereas SSRIs are uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they're acting on these uh, transporters that are um, uh, basically, you know, on the, on the cell surfaces that 
take the serotonin back in and recycle it in the uh, through the cells. Uh, so if you you know block those reuptakes, that's going to increase at least for some period of time the serotonin that uh, that's in the clefts um, uh, um, between the cells uh, because they're not being taken up as much. Uh, so anyway, just to just to say that you know even though they're using the you know it's it's affecting these uh, the serotonin. Uh, neurotransmitters, it's uh, that they have a very different mechanism of action. And uh, for the other uh, biochemistry nerds out there that may be like me, you know, I think that, you know, just wanted to show you that you can see serotonin down at the, uh, um, the bottom left here. And you can see how very similar to uh, serotonin psilocybin is and DMT. Um, LSD, you can see it's got this, um, this uh, um, you know, moiety down here that's very similar to part of the serotonin, but then it's got this other, th other big chunk there on the top. Uh, LSD does tend to last a little bit longer. It's very, very potent. And so uh, this, uh, these, uh, you know, different uh, configurations up here may have something to do with why it, uh, it has its own, uh, um, you know, uh, much more powerful effects. And mescaline, um, as you can see here, it does have some similarities, but not nearly as similar to serotonin as, as, uh, as psilocybin. And for the real geeks, here's fluoxetine, which you can see how uh, it, it might uh, plug up the works uh, someplace and if, you're, if you're trying to recycle your uh, serotonin. So some uh, um, typical clinical effects of hallucinogens, um, somatic symptoms. So these would be having to do with your body, um, weakness, tremors, uh, nausea, drowsiness, paresthesias being sort of numbness, tingling kinds of sensations, uh, usually in your, your feet and, uh, and your hands, um, different kinds of perceptual symptoms, altered shapes and colors, uh, difficulty uh, um, focusing, um, you know, the, your uh, sense of hearing may be uh, um, uh, sharpened, and uh, synesthesias would be, you know, odd experiences where uh, you might look at a certain shape and it might appear a, a specific color, like the uh, the number 10 might be red, and but the number six might be green or something like this. So, um, uh, combinations of of, of uh, different sensations um, and uh, psychic symptoms, alterations in mood. Uh, people can be very uh, sensitive to the uh, environment around them, uh, which could cause uh, uh, you know you know, rapid alterations in mood, a distorted sense of time. Uh, a few minutes might feel like an hour. Um, uh, difficulty in expressing themselves, feeling depersonalized or out of their body, dreamlike uh, feelings and uh, uh, visual hallucinations. Uh, sometimes illusions too. So uh, um, you, you might see a tree, you know, blowing in the breeze and it might seem like a stadium full of people clapping or something like that. Um, so here, let's uh, t take a look at this uh, study real quick. Um, just watching my time. So uh, uh, Dr. Bogan shoots it all. Uh, previous trials have shown reductions in alcohol use with psychedelic assisted uh, therapy, particularly their pilot trial did this. Um, and of course, there's more and more reports looking at uh, um, uh, psychedelics uh, um, uh, for uh, treatment of depression and uh, saw a recent one on bipolar two disorder. Um, now it's important to remember hallucinogens are schedule one. They have no legitimate medical use. Uh, they're not FDA approved. They're available in Oregon. Uh, and, but it's interesting. It's for recreational use. It's for non-medical use, even though there's clinics set up all over the place um, and you uh, go in, pay your money, uh, you have the trip and you sit with a therapist who will uh, stay with you there for uh, uh, six hours while you're going through your time and uh, um, and, and you can have a uh, a uh, 
a uh, you know psilocybin experience. Um, it's, uh, okay. So in this study, uh, subjects were 25 to 65, no serious mental illness, no current treatment, um, couldn't have used uh, psychedelics uh, very extensively in the past. Um, and the way they set it up, it was 36 weeks. The first four weeks, they had weekly therapy sessions, either uh, CBT, uh, you know, focusing on their alcohol use problems, um, or uh, there were uh, uh, sessions meant to prepare them for their medication session with the psilocybin. Um, then uh, after that, they had their first eight hour psychedelic session. Um, they had uh, uh, then another four therapy sessions, again, you know, like two CBT and two, um, uh, um, you know, focused on the psychedelic sessions, a, a second eight hour psychedelic session, and then four therapy sessions after that to basically unpack, you know, what they learned and what they were uh, planning to do um, after this in terms of their alcohol use problems. Uh, they did have an active placebo. This was a placebo-controlled trial. Uh, the, for the first session, it was a 50 milligrams of uh, Benadryl, diphenhydramine. And then for the second uh, um, uh, uh, psychedelic session, uh, they received 100 milligrams. Uh, for the uh, psilocybin dose, it was 25 milligrams for uh, 70 kilograms. And then if the person felt like they could tolerate more or wanted more, uh, they could go up to 30 or 40 milligrams if they needed for their second treatment. So for the medication set session, it was pretty simple. Uh, they you know, knew the, uh, the uh, therapists that they were going to uh, spend time with. They laid on a couch uh, with eye shades, were told to relax. They had a dreamy kind of new age playlist and soft classical kinds of music to uh, listen to. And we're told to just think about themselves, turn their attention inward. And so there were two therapists. Now, this wasn't clear to me at first why that would be. So I just want people to think about that a little bit. Um, and, uh, and we'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. Primary outcome is a percentage of heavy drinking days. Uh, so that was what they were going to focus on in terms of uh, outcome measures. And as you notice here, about one out of six people that were screened were enrolled. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting about these kinds of studies is actually you know, there's some that only 5% of people um, that are screened uh, were uh, uh, eligible for. So these are a highly select group of people that, uh, that do these studies. Um, so if we look here at the demographics, mid 40s uh, for the people, as you can see here, the, the folks that are doing these studies are, are pretty middle class. These are not your typical people in substance use studies. Uh, this, uh, you know, one person uh, uh, here in the psilocybin group was uh, made four million dollars a year. So, you know, these are, are folks with quite a bit of means. Um, it was a little bit uh, higher percentage of males than females. And, uh, you know, a large majority white, uh, which is also uh, pretty common for these uh, uh, hallucinogen uh, studies. Um, so if we look at the drinking days, uh, uh, about three quarters of the time uh, patients were drinking in every month. Uh, and uh, half of that time were heavy drinking days. Uh, heavy drinking day being, um, you know, five or greater for men and uh, four standard drinks or, or greater in women. Um, uh, drinks per day on average over the month, about uh, four or five. Uh, but drinks per drinking day, uh, you know, quite a bit more, seven, uh, which is uh, is is you know, quite a heavy, quite heavy drinking. Uh, the number of dependence criteria. So this was DSM uh, four. So uh, five out of seven. Uh, so uh, you know, moderately heavy drinking. Uh, although they do point out that in in many alcohol use studies, uh, uh, people are are heavier drinkers than this. Um, 
and uh, been dependent on alcohol for uh, you know quite a number of years, uh, 13, 15 years. And uh, the WHO risk category, so the you know, WHO risk categories you can see here, uh, you know, very high, high, very high uh, for most of the people, although there are some people with low uh, to, to moderate um, severity. Uh, subjects were asked to reduce and attempt to stop drinking in the four weeks prior to the first session. And uh, as you'll see, uh, many did uh, reduce pretty significantly. Uh, subjects and therapists, um, as you might imagine, could discriminate who got the active drug over 90% of the time. Uh, so really, it wasn't particularly blinded. Um, it, you know, uh, Benadryl is, is, you know, people are not going to confuse Benadryl for uh, uh, psilocybin effects. Um, now, interesting, I thought, that um, uh, of the people that received placebo, only 35 wanted uh, to to take a medication during that second session you know, uh, and uh, and not even all of the people that got the psilocybin you know in the psilocybin condition wanted to receive that second uh, session only 43 out of the 48 uh, wanted to take psilocybin uh, in the uh, in the second session um really didn't have a lot of adverse effects some increased blood pressure some high um and what they uh said was that the people uh, in the psilocybin uh, uh, condition said that they had pretty uh, high average intensity effects, whereas uh, the uh, um, diphen had remained low average. So uh, these are the uh, graphs. Um, and um, I think what you'll notice, uh, and what was very prominent to me, is there was a lot of reduction in alcohol use um, in the first uh, four weeks. So um, people actually did quite a bit of um, uh, of, uh, um, of of work in that regard. Uh, you know, in 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 you know, even before they started. Um, here you see the first. Um, uh, um, uh, a psychedelic session here here uh, at uh, week one to four, and then the second one. And you'll see that uh, people, uh, you know, managed to reduce their uh, alcohol use. Uh, this is heavy drinking days in the, in the top one here uh, on the left-hand side. And it stayed pretty much the same. So they went down from... Uh, uh, heavy drinking days, you, you know, what, 50, 60 percent down to 20 percent and kept that uh, through the uh, um, the 36, you know, the, the, the 32 weeks of follow up. Uh, the folks it, that uh, received the um, uh, uh, psilocybin uh, treatment uh, reduced even further. It went down uh, boy, under 10 percent. And however, it did creep up a little bit. And as you can see here, um, heavy drinking days uh, percent was about 20% in the uh, diphenhydramine versus 10% in the psilocybin. Um, and uh, here you can see very similar for the uh, uh, percent uh, uh, drinking days um, uh, went down lower in the psilocybin, but significantly lower uh, as well as drinks per day, uh, about two for the uh, diphenhydramine group and one on average in the um, psilocybin group. Um, in abstinence, uh, the folks in the psilocybin group, about 50% uh, by the end of the study were uh, abstinent from alcohol versus 25 in the diphenhydramine. So about you know, twice as many people. Um, and uh, as you can see here, no heavy drinking, uh, also uh, sig signif uh, significantly uh, greater in the uh, placebo group. So um, we have to uh, we have to uh, finish up here pretty soon. Uh, I think in summary, um, the the thing that that's very striking here is that 
there were uh, you know significant differences, but both conditions greatly improved. And uh, it, you know, it, essentially, it was unblinded, and there was a very powerful drug effect. But one wonders just how much uh, this was due to expectations versus a specific um, effect of the uh, of the psilocybin. Um, because the, you know, it certainly wasn't blinded. And uh, one, you know, wonders, how, you know, how people would take that disappointment of not having the active condition. Um, uh, it was well tolerated, uh, but people were um, highly self-selected. And as you saw, uh, uh, they... Um, uh, I, I wonder you know, what people were doing to sort of continue on their, um, you know, successful reduction in, in uh, alcohol use. Uh, you know, a lot of these people were spending a lot of time, you know, basically intoxicated. So what were they doing? And uh, I, 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 it made me wonder whether it would have been worthwhile looking at sort of socioeconomically, the people, you know, with fewer, you know, with less sort of recovery capital, uh, you know, um, less financial means, whether they did as successfully with their um, uh, with their alcohol reduction over time as the people that uh, had more money. Um, so, um, and, of, you know, of course, there was only a 32-week uh, follow-up. So, um, you, you know, one wonders whether this would, you know, continue on over a period of time for those that weren't, you know, actively, you know, working on other kinds of recovery efforts. So to me, this shows, you know, is very interesting. It does uh, show some significant uh, benefits, but uh, because you know it's very difficult to think about how one would uh, go about truly blinding this, especially from the medication point of view. Uh, but you know, um, uh, um, you know, what specifically uh, the the uh, um, the sort of expectations of 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 the uh, of the participants had, and any sort of placebo kinds of expectation effects that uh, that may have uh, uh, affected the outcomes. So uh, today we don't have uh, time to talk uh, really about the uh, the challenges in this and uh, and sort of the very vulnerable states that people are in. Uh, but, you know, one thing I will say, I asked you about those two folks. Um, they've been uh, doing psychedelic therapy in Switzerland for a number of years now. You know, it's, uh, it's a, an established kind of uh, therapy in uh, uh, there. And the reason they have two people is because of, uh, the patients can get uh, um, un. Uh, can get uh, ideas about what happens in the therapy that just may not be true. And so it's very important to have somebody there to uh, uh, to make sure that patients don't think they're being inappropriately touched or uh, or uh, or uh, um, in some way misinterpret uh, uh, what's going on in these sessions. Uh, so that's, you know, another one of the issues with uh, with psychedelics is that, uh, is that uh, people are in very vulnerable uh, um, states where they um, aren't necessarily interpreting their surroundings correctly. Thank you, Dr. King. We appreciate this. It's been a great presentation. I know that we would love to have more time to discuss more extensively uh, our facility. Another time. Yeah, <laughs> of course, we can certainly do a second part on this uh, topic for sure. Our facilitator lost connection with the internet doing, uh, of course, oh, okay. to the, the crazy weather. So let's move to, um, we probably have time for one or two questions before we move to our case presentation. Um, do any of you have any questions or comments regarding to the topic? I'm actually curious in your research. So from my understanding, which isn't extensive, there are religious ceremony exemptions for some religious practices to use psychedelics in the United States. And I know 
one group, Native Americans, do use psychedelics in religious ceremonies and things like that, but they also have higher occurrences of alcohol use disorder. Do you know if there's any studies out there kind of looking at that population and that group and the cross-section of those two things? That, that sounds like a good CTN study there, Dr. Walker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not aware, aware of that at all. Is that Dr. Dr. King, may, I, may I comment? Yeah. Yes, so, please. So, Dr. Walker, that's a that's a great question. So, I recently, probably over six months back, came across an article. As you know, as you rightly said, the Navajo Nation, the Native American Church, are allowed to use psilocybin during certain times of the year. And then there is another, uh, 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 I think, a Portuguese church that's allowed to use DMT. So I don't know about the Portuguese in the, that, but but clearly among the Navajo, the rates the Navajo claim, and there is there is a it's an article I was on it was on a study, but the Navajo claim that they have less alcoholism as compared to other Native American groups because of their use of of uh, psilocybin. So mm -hmm. again, that's it's an article. It was really not a study, but uh, but that's what I read. So okay, well that's for sure, Dr. Walker. So that was a, that was a great question that came from you. So that's uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, but, and like, but, but, like, but, yeah. but but it also would mean that, you know, maybe a significant number of people are actually involved in some structured kinds of, of you know, ceremonial kinds of activities, which in and of itself might mitigate uh, excessive drinking and substance use. So um, who knows? Interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I apologize for going back and forth because the internet here has been really uh, crazy. But with that, um, thank you, Dr. King, for your wonderful presentation. And we will move on to the next part of our session. Um, Kato, if you could please share an announcements. Thank you. To claim CMEs, please text 1009-52632-844-502-1338. You must text by midnight tonight to receive the CME credit. Next slide, please. Do you have a difficult case that you or your team have encountered? CSTAT offers you the opportunity to present any challenge your organization is encountering and receive feedback from our hub of experts and broader learning community. There is no need to prepare a formal presentation. We will provide you with a case form that you can fill out to assist your case presentation. You can email us at cstat at yutiska.edu. Next slide. The 2024 Texas Substance Use Symposium is officially open for registration. This free event will feature complimentary continuing education curricula, interactive panel discussions, and professional networking with national and Texas-based substance use disorder experts. Texas is also open to sponsors and exhibitors. To learn more on how to become a sponsor or an exhibitor, please or to register, please visit texas.org. Next slide. Join CSTAT and the Texas Health and Human Services for an eight-part webinar series to explore the intersection between behavioral health, substance use disorder, and COVID-19. Our inaugural session, Preparing for the Triple Threat, Rising Rates of RSV, COVID, and Flu, will be happening on Friday, February 2nd. Uh, you can register using the link in the chat. Next slide. And please join us for our next session, which will be on Tuesday, February 20th. Uh, Dr. Kowalchuk has an interesting session lined up. Thank you. And with that, we will move on to our case. Uh, um, Kato, if you could uh, bring up the case form. Uh, and Dr. Evil, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Sure. Can everyone hear me? OK. Yes. Okay. So I actually was going to not spend too much time just on the case form. Like basically I can summarize um, that the patient that I'm about to present about has uh, severe alcohol use disorder, met full criteria for that. But I thought things would flow better if I just did a few quick slides, but I promise it'll be really fast. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, so maybe we could just go to the PowerPoint. If you don't mind, thank you. Oh, 
Okay, so this is um, what I'm presenting about, or the case I'm presenting about is using uh, phenobarbital in a case of complicated alcohol withdrawal um, here in the inpatient uh, setting. So, and I have no disclosures um, for this. So some of the questions that I wanted to pose to everyone are when to consider using phenobarbital for the treatment of acute alcohol withdrawal in the inpatient setting, how to overcome fear and hesitancy that we find sometimes not only just um, with myself, but my coworkers too, about using phenobarbital and when to use it. And then also uh, whether or not to combine benzodiazepines with phenobarbital. And then one other question I wanted to add if we have time is I'm curious to hear from people how they typically dose phenobarbital and if they like to do tapers, because we see some people use it and taper it here versus just giving like single doses uh, back to back. So I would be curious what people's experience with that is. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so the patient JA is a 32 year old male history of alcohol use disorder complicated by a history of seizures and DTs in the past in the context of withdrawal. Also a history of cirrhosis and depression who came in September, 2023 to the emergency room with nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain. Um, the patient reported relapsing on alcohol three days ago and had been drinking an unknown amount since that time. We were consulted for assistance in managing his alcohol withdrawal. Okay, next slide. So just a brief history. I'm not going to go through all of his history, but related to the alcohol, he started drinking at age 14, heavily in his 20s. Typically, he would drink six to 12, 24 ounce beers a day and had reported whenever we saw him that he had been abstinent for the last two or three months, but then relapsed three days prior to admission in the context of a family member passing away. He, again, was drinking an unknown number of 24 ounce beers a day uh, for the last three days. And the last drink, he said, was about 24 hours prior to admission, but he was kind of vague about that. Um and again, he reported a history of DTs and seizures as well as an ICU admission. Uh, longest period of sobriety was about one year around 2020. He's never been to any prior uh, rehabilitation programs. He reported he'd been to AA a few times, but not recently. And in terms of uh, medications, he had taken uh, a camprosate, naltrexone, gabapentin, but only for like really brief periods of time, typically mostly in the hospital and never uh, for very long after he discharged from the hospital. But he had reported that a camprosate was helpful in the past. So, and then I'll just quickly, I think the next slide walks y'all through the, oh, really quickly. So physical exam, um, Nothing too significant other than he appeared uncomfortable and had mild tremors, um, a little bit of abdominal tenderness, but I'm just listing the pertinent things here. In terms of the mental status exam, he was alert and oriented times four. He was anxious appearing. He was also importantly somewhat guarded and vague. Like the history that he provided was kind of inconsistent in terms of like when his last drink was and how many drink, how many days he had been drinking for. So if it doesn't add up, that's probably why, because he gave different reports to different people but he was generally linear in his thought process and he denied auditory visual hallucinations. In terms of his vitals, he was afebrile, pulse was 98, blood pressure 138 over 91, O2 sat was fine on room air. I just did the pertinent labs. Uh, the main lab was his BAL was 293, urine drug screen was negative, um, basic metabolic panel was unremarkable. Um, in terms of his liver function tests, the AST was just mildly elevated, but ALT within normal limits, total bilirubin within normal limits. CBC, the only thing remarkable about it was the platelets were low at 83, uh, and PT and INR were within normal limits. Okay, next slide. I think this is where we go. I know this is a lot of information, but this is kind of where the question comes in about how to manage the patient. So I'll try to go through this quickly. 
So basically day one, uh, whenever we saw the patient, um, he was started on a diazepam taper, initially 10 milligrams TID. In addition, we started him on gabapentin. I believe it was 300 milligrams TID, a campers 666 milligrams TID. He was also on CWA with Ativan and thiamine as well. Uh, day two of his hospitalization, he was stable with mild withdrawal, but then in the afternoon, his CWA scores uh, went up to 14, and then they went into the 20s. The MICU was consulted, but they felt the patient was well enough to stay on the medical floor. So the only thing that happened at that point was his Valium dose was increased to 10 milligrams QID, so a total of 40 a day. Um, and he was still scoring on the CWA with Ativan too, so getting additional Ativan. On day three, he was noted to be in moderate to severe withdrawal. So instead of tapering the Valium, it was continued at 10 milligrams QID again. And he's still on the other meds like the Gabapentin, the Camprol, the CWA with Ativan. Day four, overnight, he became confused and agitated. He required restraints. Um, on evaluation, he was disoriented, responding to internal stimuli, and he was continued still on the Valium 10 milligrams QID, as well as the other medications that I've mentioned. Day five, uh, overnight, his C was climbed again into the 20s. He was increasingly agitated. There was no improvement despite receiving the PRN Ativan. Finally, the MICU accepted the patient and um, he received 260 milligrams IV of phenobarbital without improvement. Then they also gave a small dose of Haldol, 2.5 milligrams IM. And then shortly later, the patient had seizure-like activity, uh, was intubated for airway protection. They started continuous EEG. The patient was loaded with Keppra. Um, the ICU, which is what typically happens here at Parkland, depending on the attending, they discontinued everything else since he was getting phenobarbital. They discontinued the Valium, they Camprosate since he was intubated, the Gabapentin since he was intubated. They also stopped any type of CWA scoring. They gave him additional phenobarbital 130 milligrams IV while he was intubated in the afternoon. The next day he was extubated. Um, he continued to have these episodes of seizure-like events where like his arms tensed up and he looked uh, very anxious, but nothing correlated on the EEG. The patient was then continued on phenobarbital 60 milligrams BID and Keppra was continued as well. After day six, the patient is transferred to the floor. He continues to have moderate withdrawal, but is more with it. He's alert and oriented times four. Um, he continues to have this seizure lack activity, which we start to think is probably severe anxiety because nothing is correlating on the EEG with it. He's still on Keppra and phenobarbital. The phenobarbital is at 60 milligrams BID still. Since he's on the floor, we take back over his care and we restart him on a diazepam taper. He's also able to take gabapentin and camperol again. So, um, and he's also restarted on the CWA with PRN Ativan. We also added baclofen at that point to see if that could potentially help. And that was day seven through nine. And then um, day 10, he has, he's improving with mild withdrawal and his anxiety is better. The phenobarbital and the Valium tapers are completed. And then he switched from Keppra to Depakote um, and continued on the Camperol and Gabapentin and tapered on the Baclofen. I know this is a lot of information, but um, eventually he's discharged on day 11. He's on Depakote, Gabapentin, and a camper site, a discharge. And he, the plan was for follow-up at the addiction clinic, which he initially did. But since that time he's missed, uh, since back in October, he's missed multiple appointments and follow-up calls. So unfortunately, um, so that's a summary. I know that was a lot of information and I'm happy to run anyone through. So basically, um, my questions related to all of this is when should phenobarbital have been considered? Uh, like when would, when would someone else have considered phenobarbital in a case like this? Um, and how to overcome the hesitancy about starting phenobarbital in a case like this, whether or not to continue the benzodiazepines whenever phenobarbital is started, and then thoughts on dosing and tapering of it. And also, I'm open to any suggestions people have or just thoughts uh, about management in general. So, 
Uh, yeah, th thanks. That, that's very interesting. You know, I always wonder about these stories of people that, you, you know, have long alcohol histories. They say that they have only been drinking for a weekend and, and then they've got like this horrible withdrawal. Does, does, you know, are we sure that he wasn't drinking longer than three days? I, I agree. Mean, it just seems yeah. just like, it, you know, crazy. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe, you know, more about because I don't do a lot of inpatient uh, withdrawal stuff, but um, it seems like there's some people that are just not very responsive to benzos. You know, it's it's unusual, but sometimes and I guess those, you know, this is the kind of guy where you would want to, you know, put in his chart, you, you know, d d don't bother with benzos because uh, because really he's going to need something different. Do you, have you seen that yourself? Um, we have a few people I can think of now that have had such bad withdrawal that we basically start them on not high dose phenobarbital, but a lower dose of phenobarbital in addition to some benzos too, whenever they come in, because just time and time again, they've been so difficult to treat. And you're right. It's like they don't respond to the benzos like other patients do. So, yeah, why why not just like do one or the other? I used to do outpatient phenobarb detoxes, basically a patient, you know, because if you give people clonopin, they like, like it too much. <laughs> you know, they don't want to ever come off, but, uh, with, you know, with phenobarb, eh, they, they don't like it so much. And uh, it just seemed to be an easier medication to use to, uh, um, to get, you know, to keep people semi-motivated to, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, continue tapers. What I had always been taught is that they work well, like the benzodiazepines and phenobarbital work nicely together. Like we often will go way down on the benzodiazepine dose whenever we pair it with the phenobarbital, but it, it makes it more effective in terms of at the receptor and everything. And they bond and work in different ways. But I, I know that a lot of other people here at UT Southwestern do not like to pair the two together. So we kind of go back and forth about whether to do that or not. So I don't know what other people think. Dr. Yon, that was an excellent presentation. So I, I think I agree with Dr. King. I I remember when I was a resident, we had a few attendings who just did phenobarbital. Yeah. Uh, inpatient and outpatient and it worked beautifully. I, it, mm -hmm. Phenobarb just kind of took a backseat since we have, since benzos have kind of been the kind of the mainstay of alcohol withdrawal treatment. And I think that's really unfortunate because like I said, Phenobarb works very well. I, I still remember as a resident, we would start people on 30 QID and mm -hmm. then just gradually taper them. And, and it has a lot of intermediate metabolites that stay in for a long time. So it's a, it's a very useful agent to, to treat. Yes, I am a little bit conflicted about the combination. You know, I mean, I would rather do one or the other rather than do both. Dr. King, what do you think about that? I mean, have you done both before? No, I, I've always just done one or the other because one. then you run into like, well, you, you know, what? That, you know, which one are you going to? Now, maybe some people feel like, oh, well, you use this proportion or something. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's it just seems hard to harder to control. You know what uh, what you've uh, what you're using if the if uh, if you're using two that are going to do pretty similar things. Yeah, so I've worked in a setting um, where we've used both, and we tend to will use um, uh, the benzodiazepine symptom driven, and then a nightly dose of phenobarbital, not tapered, um, and at times a pretty hefty dose up to 120 milligrams, depending on the patient's history, but particularly when the patient is has a history of repeated episodes of seizures and DTs with withdrawal because of the kindling effect. Um, and I've even had patients um, long time ago now when I did more inpatient um, who would start their withdrawal process and even have withdrawal seizures with still a very significant BAL on board, yeah. um, just from the severity of their their physical dependence to the alcohol. Um, I currently, yeah. because I'm in a residential setting, not in a hospital setting, um, I'm uncomfortable doing 
both of them together regularly. I'll usually choose one or the other um, for alcohol withdrawal use. Um, the other, um, you know, in the previous place I was working where we did do both, um, one of the reasons given that I wasn't a senior person at that time, so I was just learning was that it really, um, the benzo still helped a lot with the anxiety and kind of the dysphoria that the phenobarb was really great at um, handling uh, some of the other autonomic symptoms, but not as great as relieving some of the kind of um, mental um, emotional symptoms that the um, benzos were pretty good at doing. Um, so that was the reason to approach both. Um, I guess reading this case, one of my big concerns was the ICU chose to give Haldol and lower their seizure threshold. And soon after they seized, I don't think you can directly attribute because he had a lot of reasons to seize. Um, but that was really concerning. I guess my other concern is, again, not so much in the setting I am now because, um, you know, we don't have enough uh, and it's not a, we don't have an intensive care unit right down the hall or a, a, a phone call away. Um, but when I did work in a more inpatient setting, I, we, we would go way up on the valley. And I mean, we had patients that were on over 100 milligrams a day. And so it seemed like those first few days, um, there was maybe some missed opportunity to get on top of things by being more aggressive with the Valium, especially knowing that if the person gets in, I don't know, maybe um, when folks were going by, they were pretty sedated, um, but it didn't look like that based on you know the presentation shown. And so just kind of that mental block sometimes of, wow, Valium, and now we're up to 60 and, do we hit a hundred and do we shoot past a hundred? And I was always trained to just, you know, uh, as long as the person is um, not sedate and is, you know, um, breathing well, um, you just keep going up on the benzo. Um, and so I think that it was, I was surprised how low the dose was actually given their presentation. Those were my only thoughts on the case. That's really helpful because I think some of us get stuck. Like me personally, I don't go too high above 10, four times a day very often. And I think some other people similarly in the department. So it's really helpful to hear you say that that's not that much really in the big scheme of things. So, because I really think we did miss an opportunity to either go up on it or switch to phenobarbital way earlier, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he, he was at 29, you know, I would have just doubled everything at that point. Mm -hmm. Instead of going up to 10 QID, I would have gone to 20 QID probably, because <laughs> mm -hmm. it sounded like he was in really pretty tough shape. Mm -hmm. And again, that's in a hospital setting. You're doing right. it in a residential setting. You know, I'm, I'm not comfortable. And that would be the time I'd say, okay, we've got to transfer this person to a more yeah. intensive level of care. But in yeah. a hospital setting, you know, where intubation, you know, can happen pretty quickly if you overshoot. Um, I mean, that's, that's how I was trained anyway, just you just keep going up and we'd routinely have people well over 100 if needed. David, you had a... Yeah, uh, this is not about the clinical medication or anything, but on the second to last slide, uh, it said that the patient uh, intended to uh, go to AA. Uh, and I'm wondering if there was any follow-up. Did he contact AA? Uh, and if there wasn't any follow-up, uh, it's a suggestion that uh, maybe getting someone from AA to come talk to him before uh, his discharge would be effective. We do have a great peer recovery specialist that works with our team. And I know that she met with him and talked with him about AA. Um, I don't, once he was more like lucid and everything, um, and they did reach out to him. The last person that talked to him at clinic wasn't our peer recovery specialist, but it was one of our social workers. And she spoke with him and confirmed that he was attending AA, but that was back in October, I think, whenever I said, but then since then, nobody's been able to connect with him. So unfortunately, but. Yeah, I certainly think that was one of the few things that he did kind of show some interest in was the AA, so. Well, thank thank you, you so much. And thank you, Dr. Evil, for the wonderful case and initiating this discussion. Um, Dr. Walker, if you could please help summarize today's case. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is an excellent case. I'll try to get this done in uh, under two minutes. So lots and lots of information presented. 32-year-old male with a long, maybe 12-year history of alcohol use reported only three days of returning to use after about a three-month period without. But considering his symptoms and the severity of his withdrawal, there were questions on if it really was just a three-day return to use or potentially longer than that. The meat of the discussion was around treatment, and I think the three main topics that were presented were what is the hesitancy around using phenobarbital in alcohol use or alcohol withdrawal, especially if it's complicated, and a couple of things were presented. One was, well, it used to be more widely used, and so there was more comfort around it when it was more widely used, but it's taken a bit of a backseat lately, and that taking a backseat may have led to uh, providers currently being a little bit more hesitant, but there is a time and place to use it. But when you are using it, taking into consideration using it with benzodiazepines and when is it appropriate to combine them and when is it appropriate to use them individually? And a couple of things that were discussed to take into consideration, the biggest one being setting. Are they in a residential? Are they in an outpatient? Do they have access to medical providers and the ability to intubate and things of that nature. And so considering the setting is going to be important and considering if you should be using them in combination or individually. And then the other thing to consider is the patient's history with withdrawal. Do they have a history of complicated withdrawal? Is there a potential kindling effect where they've been through withdrawal so many times that each one may be getting worse and worse? And the third thing that was considered is, have they ever been responsive to benzos in the past? Do they have a history of not being responsive? And should you initiate phenobarbital earlier? So I think that's all that was discussed and in, in two minutes. <laughs> thank you so much for that wonderful summary, Dr. Walker. And thank you all uh, for attending today's session. Despite the cold weather, thank you for making it here. Um, as a reminder, uh, to earn Z credits, uh, please text the activity code 1009-5263-844-502-1338 by midnight tonight. We also request you complete the post-session survey using the link in the chat. The survey link will be open for one week. If you'd like to present a case, please email cstat at tithiska.edu. We look forward to seeing you at our next session on Tuesday, February 20th. Thank you, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay warm. Bye-bye.